Yeah. Uh, thanks everyone uh, for coming to my talk. Today I'm uh, talking about, uh, about open roadmaps uh, for your open communities. And just to share some context, uh, so I've spent about 10 years in Jenkins. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to build communities. And actually building roadmap was one of my attempts to onboard uh, contributors. So if you listen to the previous uh, talk by Don, I'm exactly that burnt out maintainer uh, in the project. Uh, so, uh, in 2020, I had a massive burnout and depression. Uh, let's say my life has been a mess ever since, and uh, I'm still in the recovery. But uh, uh, finally, I'm doing some public talks uh, too. Uh, so, I spent a lot of time uh, in uh, open source. I started in Jenkins, then I participated in Captain Open Feature, I'm currently on the TUC of the Continuous Delivery Foundation. I participated in uh, the CNCF. And in the last year, I spent uh, more time volunteering in open intelligence communities and various anti-war organizations, basically doing community management, uh, chopping water and carrying water. And I assure you that uh, open society organizations are not that different for, from open source. It has been a quite a good experience. So, as I said, today we are talking about open roadmaps. Uh, slides are public, you can find them here. Uh, the first version of these slides was created uh, for CDCon at uh, to, uh, 2021. Uh, this is when we introduced our public roadmap in Jenkins. And today I actually want to do a kind of retrospective on uh, what happened afterwards. Because uh, when you introduce uh, something, it's cool. But uh, when a few years pass, uh, the situation may change a bit. And actually, it's a case for Jenkins. So today, it's not a success story. Not at all. I'm going to actually to talk about what we tried to do in terms of open roadmaps and what worked, what didn't, and how you can do better. Okay, uh, who has ever created a, a roadmap for your project? Okay, uh, pre, uh, a lot of people here. So yeah, the audience is right for this talk. So uh, yeah, what is the roadmap? Actually, there is a lot of definition. Uh, so many people think that roadmap is just a timeline with quarters where you commit on some, when you commit on something. This is uh, what is usually a product roadmap communicated uh, to your customers. But in open source, it's not necessarily the case. It's uh, just a definition uh, where we talk about short-term and long-term goals uh, and what we actually want to deliver. Uh, when I talk about roadmaps, uh, I take this definition. And actually, roadmaps can take different forms. So first of all, it doesn't have to be formal at all. Uh, all of us create various slides for bosses or for presentations. And actually, it's a good form of roadmap too. Uh, for example, this is a roadmap of uh, Continuous Delivery Foundation 6, uh, focusing on interoperability. And basically, it exists just as slides. Why not uh, if it works? Another possible form is dashboards. Uh, yeah, all of us use GitHub, GitLab, or Jira, so we can create a lot of dashboards. Uh, sometimes people even take a look at them. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is one of uh, common examples. You can also have a roadmap just as text. It's also key. So currently, it's uh, common to have roadmap MD in the root of your repository that describes something or points to another form. And if it works for your community, that's perfectly fine. If you have a large project, for example, like Jenkins, you can try creating your own roadmap engine. This is probably a bad idea in 99% uh, cases, but uh, you definitely can do so. <clears throat> so, yeah, as I said, in Jenkins, we introduced our public roadmap, and one of the goals was to maintain and grow the open source community. Uh, I guess everyone knows Jenkins there, uh, so it's open source automation framework, uh, which has been uh, super popular for CI/CD. Even in 2023, it uh, dominates on the market. It has more than 50% of uh, uh, market in this area. Uh, why it happened, we will talk later. But what matters here, it's open source. It has huge community. It has a lot of plugins, and it has thousands of contributors every year. Now it's a part of the Continuous Delivery Foundation. So whether you like Jenkins or not, uh, this talk m might be relevant. And yeah, I'm also not a Jenkins zealot, so I can totally understand. Um, so uh, just a few numbers. So this is statistics from 2019, when basically Jenkins reached the top number of uh, uh, 
contributors. So it had more than 5,000 contributors from uh, more than 200 companies. Uh, many of them have been contributing heavily. There were something like five uh, Jenkins vendors participating this year. And uh, at this point, Jenkins was the second biggest community in the CNCF CDF ecosystem. So just behind Kubernetes. For the record, now it's not true. There are new projects, for example, Open Telemetry, which is kind of bad. And uh, yeah, the things evolve uh, quite quickly. I, uh, uh, what were the key reasons for us? Uh, Jenkins was extensible, it was general purpose, uh, you were able to automate any kind of flow. And uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, receptor of success for Jenkins was its community. Because what we did uh, from the very beginning of uh, Jenkins at Hudson, that project basically targeted open governance, uh, community-driven development. So if you remember the drama in 2011, 2012, when uh, Hudson was renamed to Jenkins, you can see how actually open community can overcome uh, even big companies and company interests. And, uh, Ever since, Jenkins has been contributor-driven. So the contributors uh, defined the strategy for the project. Uh, they defined what gets delivered and how it gets delivered. And it has always been open to any individual and a company. So everyone could, in theory, join the project and contribute there. In practice, of course, it could be a bit different. Uh, one of the difficult uh, points is uh, that in our community, we decided that maintainers have full freedom. Uh, so there are multiple community organizations. Uh, in Jenkins, we use an organization which we used to call Workloads. So every plugin maintainer, every library maintainer could do anything they wanted. It helped us uh, to establish a quite healthy community with a lot of developments. At the same time, it created a lot of segmentation in the community. So basically, every plugin, every maintainer, uh, uh, they had their approaches to development, to quality, uh, and it basically negatively impacted the sustainability of the project. It wasn't a single project, it was a bunch of isolated sub-communities, for example, configuration is called pipeline, and everywhere where the practices or the standards were different. Also, for us, at this scale, we experienced a lot of transparency issues, because for a long time, it wasn't clear what the heck happens in Jenkins. Uh, there is a reason for that, because every contributor does what they want, they deliver uh, what they want, but uh, it's not clear uh, what is actually the project's direction, what is the focus of the project, and it impacted us a lot. So I joined uh, Jenkins' uh, uh, core maintainer team in 2014, and ever since I've heard questions, so where Jenkins is going, it's not clear what happens there, it's just stale. And uh, it was a very valid point because it wasn't uh, really clear uh, what happens unless you're inside this community and unless you're on the developer mailing list and actually communicate. Um, also, it uh, led to perception of vendor lock-in uh, because, uh, yeah, I used to work for CloudBees and uh, at uh, many times people were asking, so uh, what does CloudBees do with Jenkins? How CloudBees drives the project? It has never been a case. CloudBees has never been an owner of the project, uh, and it has never been uh, a single decision maker in the project. But uh, it was perceived, and it actually steered away a lot of company contributors who wanted to join and who were not sure about what would the, be the project uh, direction. Also, for us, it was uh, difficult uh, to get uh, multiple contributors uh, behind big initiatives. So, for example, configuration is called Jenkins Pipeline and many other things which got famous later. They were done just by a small group of contributors so when uh, generally uh, they needed something big and a lot of coordination. For example, a working group, a special interest group in modern terms. But in Jenkins, it wasn't the case for years. It was really difficult to find contributors. And the stupid uh, thing that actually we had a lot of contributors who were uh, looking around in the project, uh, who were looking at where to contribute to, but they were unable to find uh, where to contribute, how to join initiatives, how to start participating. And basically, yeah, for such a project, uh, it was a shame that we weren't able to leverage this opportunity. Um, Actually, in the leadership, we have understood this problem long ago, and uh, we had a, a long uh, journey of consolidating the community and uh, making open governance actually working. 
So we started governance meeting just in 2011. Uh, then we started various teams. We introduced sub-projects, officers. We started uh, contributor summits, uh, which happen now offline and uh, online. We started formal enhancement proposal process. We started uh, various interest groups. And we actually tried to uh, overcome the issues uh, of the community growth. And to some extent it worked, uh, so in 2018 and 2019, we had around 100 uh, regular contributors in the core team uh, and plugins driving the project. 100 contributors sounds awesome for many projects, I guess, but for Jenkins it was not enough. If you have 2,500 repositories and 2,500 nominally active components, uh, then probably uh, 100 uh, maintainers is not enough for that. And actually, in 2020, when we discussed our state, we had a contributor summit. Our biggest question was how we go ahead. Uh, this uh, contributor summit happened at FOSDOM uh, right before COVID lockdowns. So as you can imagine, all our plans uh, didn't exactly happen like we planned. Uh, but um, one of uh, the outcomes was actually public roadmap. For us, public roadmap was an attempt to actually become clear where the project is going and to make it possible to all contributors uh, to demonstrate it. So it happened, started at FOSDOM and then by July, just several months later, we announced it uh, through all the public processes. And what was the point again? Uh, first of all, we wanted to have everything driven by the community. So there would be no Jenkins core maintainers team, Jenkins governance board or other entity dis defining the roadmap. Everything would be managed by community contributors and it would be open for participation. The roadmap would be uh, fully publicly accessible. We also wanted open data for various kinds of integrations. At the same time, we made a few decisions uh, that might be very controversial for end users. First of all, we decided that we make no commitment on these because this is how not it works in contributor driven project. If you have contributors, something happens. If you don't, then it, it doesn't. And uh, what was weird uh, was, was con confused people a lot that we actually made no commitment on delivery at all uh, because it was fine for us to cancel initiatives uh, if something wasn't moving. So we introduced roadmap with these assumptions. Uh, it was around for something like two years. Um, and um, our key target audience was firstly Jenkins users. Uh, but also contributors. We wanted to show contributors where to contribute, where we are going, where you can participate, and uh, adopters and vendors, because we needed them to invest their resources to develop various complex components that wouldn't happen uh, without uh, company engagement. And uh, at that point, we also decided that we put everything on the roadmap. It wasn't just features, but it was a lot of uh, backend community stuff, uh, including documentation, infrastructure, services, community governance. So our idea was to have a community roadmap, not a project roadmap, which was super essential in Jenkins because by that time we basically had, let's say, a dozen of semi-independent projects operating within the same community. And uh, it kind of worked. I just want to show you a few examples. So for example, uh, yeah, we had a user experience and interfaces. If you use Jenkins, you can uh, confirm that user experience and developer experience is a key point. Uh, pretty much the same for cloud platforms, integrations with Kubernetes, uh, uh, operators, etc. All of that was on our roadmap. Uh, we were able to deliver most of these bits. Um, I'm not speaking about Jenkins specifically today, so I'm just glancing through these slides. And again, one of our key assumptions uh, was that the roadmap wasn't just about features. So what we had on the roadmap, uh, one of the most important thing was contributor onboarding and outreach programs. So showing everything we do about there and inviting people to actually help us to build uh, the contributor uh, onboarding pipeline. Um, also, we had developer tools, services, uh, targeting developer experience. We had a lot of open governance things, uh, community events, outreach programs, and everything was on this roadmap. Everywhere we were looking for contributors. Everywhere we invested in providing detailed guidelines how you can join. So basically every entry on the roadmap uh, uh, had a how to participate entry with detailed guidelines, sometimes with newcomer first issues. 
and uh, actually it worked. So here, for example, uh, our just current lending for onboarding contributors that was created. And currently we have something like 50 pages on our documentation specifically focused on contributing and on onboarding of new contributors. Also a bunch of videos, tutorials, online flows. And it was one of the results uh, when we were building Roadmap because we were able to actually factor in all key initiatives we wanted with participating guidelines so that people could uh, join easily. Okay. Uh, the same happened with project infrastructure because Jenkins uh, is a huge project. We use actually a lot of components. We spend something like 20K a month just on our public cloud bills. And uh, all of that is sponsored uh, thanks to everyone, uh, uh, to every company doing so. And uh, the same, uh, we actually invested a lot in enhancing our infrastructure, moving to Kubernetes, uh, making everything open source, public, reusable, uh, for example, distributions, mirrors, etc. And um, again, uh, all of that was on our roadmap, and we thought that it could help us to attract more contributors into this backend stuff, which wasn't just Jenkins. Because for us, we had a lot of Kubernetes things, we had a lot of uh, operations things, and we did contributors in these areas too. Okay, so uh, do you think that worked? No, we didn't. And, uh, and uh, yeah, this is actually uh, one of things we didn't expect. Uh, so. Items where actually we were successful, everything about features. Because we were able uh, to build a lot of things like quality and static analysis efforts, various GitHub integrations like Checks API, uh, integrations with Kubernetes, Tecton clients, various UI things like a dark theme. And all of that happened through our Trish efforts, through clear, clear roadmap and contributor onboarding flows. So we were able uh, to deliver a lot of things in the recent years thanks to investing in the, uh, the public roadmap and in the ways to contribute to public roadmap. So this is a good thing. Where it didn't actually work, um, first of all, attracting company contributors. We totally failed there. Uh, advocacy and outreach efforts, I cannot recall many new contributors uh, joining us. So we invested in having public slides, we uh, reusable slides, uh, various uh, travel grants programs, uh, it kind of worked, but we were unable uh, to onboard uh, community managers or event managers who could contribute to the community. And for us, it has been one of the bottlenecks at this scale. Because you cannot uh, just uh, drive a Google Summer of Code for 50 projects uh, in your spare time. You cannot uh, organize a contributor summit uh, easily in your spare time. It needs uh, either company contributors or dedicated communities. And for us, roadmap didn't work. And most importantly, that roadmap didn't work for roadmap itself. Um, and what is the current state? Uh, so if you take a look at the roadmap uh, YAML file, which is located somewhere in our infrastructure repository, you can see that there are just a few contributions in the recent years. So basically, roadmap is stale and outdated. And uh, this is what um, Often happens, projects get stale and outdated, but it's weird, though not uncommon, to see an active project with a stale roadmap. Actually, if you go on the internet, on GitHub, you can find a lot of projects that still keep being developed. At the same time, their roadmap may be not even accessible. It can be a deleted Google Doc. It might be a GitHub project that haven't been updated for ages. And this is a key problem with any roadmap. It's, it's sustainability. So a few challenges uh, that uh, we experienced. Of course, it was a bus factor uh, for all these efforts and for champions. It was a lot of inconsistencies on the roadmap. Of course, stale items, uh, uh, roadmap being bloated at some points by various initiatives and uh, becoming incomprehensible. Uh, and actually, a lot of initiatives that were de facto happening without being reflected on the roadmap because contributors didn't uh, want to invest in that. So bus factor. Yeah, I was one championing this roadmap from end to beginning. So uh, from beginning to the end. And basically for me, the end happened when I burnt out and was unable to maintain all these efforts. And uh, the roadmap basically got still uh, 
uh, after that because you need someone uh, to reach out to various six to projects contributors asking for items asking to participate uh, continuously update that all of that is a lot of legwork and if your community relies on a single person to do that it fails so this is what happened for, for us uh, a lot of inconsistencies uh, because the roadmap uh, for us was located in a separate location, in a separate file. Uh, you needed uh, it uh, that it uh, is regularly updated to, be, uh, to remain relevant, and it wasn't a case for us. Uh, and actually, roadmap as hot code, in my opinion, was a mistake because open data doesn't worth. Uh, uh, um, uh, the investment and maybe you should focus on something that is clear, closer to your users and your contributors so that is easily updatable and manageable. Uh, and uh, since it was hard to manage, we ended up in the situation when basically nobody bothered even this. It's just a pull request with a YAML file, uh, you merge it, everything gets updated, there is continuous delivery flow. It was uh, uh, too complex uh, for uh, many maintainers and contributors. And uh, actually, we relied on very special interest groups, on their leaders, and it didn't work at well as well, so we ended up in many items that are not relevant anymore. This is why I'm still showing you roadmap from 2020. Uh, on another side, sometimes contributors got uh, too active and created something like 30 roadmap items for minor things, which is again was too complicated. And in our case, we had to resort to various kinds of categorization, filters, and policy on uh, items uh, to make this roadmap sustainable. Ideally, you would like to have a multi-level roadmap for a complex community, but there are no tools that easily allow doing that, unless you create uh, multiple uh, GitHub projects or various kinds of dashboards, which is probably what I would recommend. In our case, it was just a bunch of filters uh, written in JavaScript, which kind of worked, but again, it defeated uh, the initial purpose of having uh, everything comprehensible on a single page. And yeah, the problem uh, which can happen everywhere, people like hacking, people like delivering stuff, prototyping, and they don't necessarily update it, even if they operate in your project. And this is what we hit. Unless you go to a contributor and say, could we please have this item on the roadmap? Or maybe even worse, you created it for them. It doesn't happen. And in our case, we tried to mitigate it various, by various special interest groups, sub-projects, to have uh, separate governance, etc. And honestly, nothing really worked at this scale. So um, this is uh, what we actually hit. And uh, the, again, uh, the roadmap, uh, which you can still see on the Jenkins IO slash roadmap, in my opinion, is not relevant, and I hold uh, quite a lot of responsibility for that. Uh, but for you, what you actually can do better if you introduce roadmap in 2023? Uh, so uh, a lot of things uh, changed at the moment. And again, my recommendation to you is that if you have issue tracker, you put the roadmap right there in front of developers and make it super easy to manage. This is what was our mistake. We chose uh, integration to be the website, a lot of our automation instead of just uh, using, let's say, Jira uh, at our point. We had a clear obstacle because we were migrating from Jira to GitHub at that point. And even by now, this migration is not fully completed. But for most of the projects, you just use GitHub projects, uh, Jira dashboard, GitLab dashboard, whatever. And uh, yeah, this is actually the way you take. I took the other way, but fortunately, the community continued and kept improving the roadmap and our visualization. So for us, even still, roadmap isn't a problem per se. And yeah, who does use GitHub here? Okay, almost everyone. So just a few tips on GitHub. I'm slowly running out of time. Uh, but yeah, in GitHub, you have GitHub projects. And now it becomes common to use GitHub projects uh, for visualizing your roadmap and the various kinds of dashboards. So GitHub projects were introduced two or three years ago uh, with a focus on the various kinds of Kanban uh, um, and uh, uh, Scrum dashboards. And this is something you can use. So basically, roadmap can be considered as Kanban. You just define a few horizons. So for example, here we have a backlog, a planned, in progress, preview, done, and that's it. So basically, you just drag items and issues between the things. 
and uh, it actually works as a roadmap remarkably well. Uh, especially uh, what makes uh, sense to mention that uh, when we talk about GitHub projects over the last few years, so there were actually three types of GitHub projects which were completely different between each other. And these days we talk about GitHub projects too, uh, which was introduced, I believe, six months ago, SJ or something like that. So for me, uh, if you have a small or a big project, if you want to centralize, uh, just take roadmap into your repository. And uh, GitHub in this case is just an example, and uh, this is a good example that works. Uh, so, for example, in the Continuous Delivery Foundation, in Captain, in Open Feature, uh, these are my recent projects. We use uh, GitHub projects, and here, for example, you can leverage a lot of bits. For example, labeling, navigation. So you click on the label here, for example, and you see all the documentation items. You can uh, also easily integrate with multiple repositories. So in GitHub projects too, uh, projects exist on the organization level, so you're not restricted by a single repository, which was a pain initially. And uh, you can actually create all these views. Uh, there is a lot of views which are basically driven by GitHub filters, so you can create a lot of slices for particular use cases. It can be a dashboard, it can be a roadmap view, it can be just a table, and it can visualize various useful things. Um, uh, so just a few limitations you need to be aware of. So UX is still not that great if you want to introduce many statuses, uh, especially on mobile. Yeah, just don't try it with GitHub. Um, and it easily gets cluttered by labels, uh, visualizations, uh, because uh, GitHub projects wasn't uh, designed for common use case. Uh, let's say in Tekton, in Jenkins, uh, we have something like 50 labels commonly used, various kind of automations like Pro. And basically all these labels get on the roadmap and it becomes a bloody mess. So, uh, and there is no way uh, to filter uh, if you don't have a JavaScript code that excludes uh, unreasonable labels. And another thing that GitHub actually not that great in terms of query language. So if you are used to Jira query language, GitHub isn't going to work for you that way. So you are going to hit a lot of limitations as project manager if you want to query things automatically. Um, another thing from the logistics standpoint, so if you have multi GitHub organization uh, community, it's not going to work for you. Uh, all uh, projects are currently tied to a single organization, so if you have separate ones, it's going to be complicated. Uh, also, you cannot easily migrate repositories once you introduce Roadmap or GitHub project. So if you have, for example, a repository uh, incubating process that uh, goes from one organization to another, which is common, for example, in Apache, in Jenkins, again, it's not going to work as this. And Another thing uh, that some items actually violate at least my vision for roadmaps. So there is new roadmap view, which is currently in beta. And it's cool, but it's basically a Gantt diagram uh, with time commitment. So if you're an open source project, I'm not sure you even want to visualize it because it creates a lot of confusion. So you can have a kind of abstract date, etc., but still it remains a Gantt diagram and it's too complicated. Just a quick summary, so roadmaps actually help to coordinate the efforts, help to onboard contributors, and help to facilitate things. Uh, they definitely help you to share the vision. At the same time, you should never consider roadmaps as a kind of schedule and commitment. And if you do, most likely you will fail in open source project unless you have a solo company behind it driving everything. Uh, and uh, I think that roadmaps are generally very helpful for open source communities. Uh, they uh, provide a lot of transparency and visibility in what happens. It's good for sustainability of the project. But at the same time, you should be always conscious about what you commit to, and you should make sure that it's simple uh, and easily understandable, and it's also easy to maintain. Because otherwise, you're at risk of creating another huge process that requires a lot of uh, maintenance time just to keep it running. And well, uh, maintenance time is the most precious resource in the modern open source communities, so you should be spending it wisely. Okay, that's it from me. I guess I still have a time for one question. <laughs> so, um, thanks a lot. It was a really great, mm -hmm. a great use case. Thank you, John. And some really mm -hmm. cool recommendations. So, there's one question uh, I have online. 
I would suggest if, if anybody else uh, just wants to chat to Oleg or has some questions, do yeah. that in the break. So here's the question. How can contributors gain enough trust to move to leadership roles in an open source project? Um, I actually have a few talks specifically on that. Oh. Uh, in my case, uh, so if you have people that want to move to leadership roles, uh, basically, you just need uh, to have a kind of role, which would be a sandbox, staging, uh, whatever it's called, that allows to people to try out maintenance powers uh, and uh, uh, leadership powers in a single, uh, relatively small entity. So it can be a special interest group, a working group, it can be uh, various companies where people just became uh, leaders in this small item. And after that, uh, when uh, they used enough, when uh, they uh, adjusted their approaches, uh, you can intro introduce them to the backbone of the community. For example, core maintainers, uh, infrastructure maintainers, so the key roles in the project. In Jenkins, we introduced uh, four-stage onboarding flow, um, and we use it. It uh, has been working quite well, uh, uh, at least for code contributors. We had uh, another process for non-code contributors, like documentation uh, or events. But in any case, we designated small group of people where you can easily get mentorship and where you can easily uh, take a lead in some uh, initiatives uh, to uh, get used to the community. So just create a sandbox. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Oleg. Mm -hmm. Uh, a big hand for Oleg. Mm -hmm. Thank you.